Well, good morning, Christ Chapel. Great to see you, great to be with you, great to worship with you on this Lord's Day. If you would, go ahead and open your Bibles to Revelation chapter three. Revelation chapter three, uh, we're gonna be in uh, verses 14 to uh, verses 22. It's page 1029. Uh, let me uh, say hello to those of you worshiping at The Hive. Congratulations on two months of meeting together. Excited about what God is doing and hope you have fun at your uh, potluck uh, lunch that you're having. I will be there uh, after the 11 o'clock service. I'm gonna come by and see you guys. And uh, let me also say uh, happy Veterans Day uh, to all the veterans. Thank you very much for your service. I don't know of another a country where people volunteer to put their lives on the line so that we can have the freedom that we do, and I know that you paid a high cost when you volunteer to be in the service, and you continue to pay a cost, a reoccurring cost, and your church loves you, and we support you, and we thank you. So thank you uh, f to all of our uh, veterans. Uh, and also, Marine Corps birthday, happy birthday, Marines. I need to say that my dad was a Marine, and so, dad, happy birthday, Marine Corps. Uh, okay, in June of 2017, uh, the Harvard Business Review uh, put out an article called The Talent Curse, which was an interesting title, uh, grabbed my attention, and so I ended up reading the article. And the article was all about how these uh, young, talented executives were growing into their role at their particular company. And the, the premise was, it was trying to highlight the challenges that young execs had trying to do wonderful and new things, but also try to fit in with the way that things were done. And it talked about the, the psychological pressure that they faced, and the article just happened to be called The Talent Curse. But I thought it was really interesting because we never think of talent as a curse. I mean, do we? I mean, th those people who are talented seem to have more friends, uh, have more fun, make more money. I mean, people that are talented or have a more celebrity status, they, they never seem to be cursed in any way. So can talent really be a curse? Well, I think when it comes to our Christian life, uh, talent can be a curse. When it comes to our spiritual walk with the Lord, here's why, because... When we look at our talent or we lean on our talent when it comes to our spiritual life, our abilities are not God-given. We see them as natural. Uh, the attitude that we have is not one of humility or dependence, but it's one of independence, that we don't need the Lord. And we run away from him because we think that we can do it all by ourselves. You see, when it comes to the spiritual life, talent can be a curse because talent can be deceptive. You can deceive yourself into thinking that you don't need the Lord and there's nothing that could be further from the truth. So Revelation chapter three, verses 14 to 22, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you would either be cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich. I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches and may we hear what the Spirit says to us, Christ's chapel. May God bless the reading of his word. Well, we, today we are going to 
in my opinion, very sadly, finish our series on the seven churches. Uh, I've had a lot of fun doing this. It's been been very convicting, but I've learned a lot uh, about this stuff. But we're going to finish our series today. Remember, the revelation is of whom? Jesus. Jesus is the victorious king. That is what is being revealed. It's the person of Jesus. It's that he's divine. It's the power of Jesus that he wins in the end. And it's the plan or program of Jesus for his people. That he has a plan for us even into all eternity. That is revelation. I've said it every week. If you don't get that by this time, go back and listen to all the sermons all over again. And you're like, no. Okay, that is the revelation. And he's revealing these things to the churches in Asia Minor to encourage them to persevere amidst their trying times. And I've tried to give a word to each of these churches, so we're just gonna do a quick summary before we jump into the church at Laodicea. So we should have a screen for you. Ephesus was all about love. You can do all the right things and still get it wrong if you don't love the Lord. Smyrna was all about suffering, be faithful unto death. Pergamum was about compromise, those things that we compromise that maybe even no one can see, the Trojan horses that we let into our lives that end up corrupting us from the inside. Thyatira was all about purity. Remember, those were the trade guilds and how we, uh, how we remain pure and set apart, even in the marketplace. Uh, Sardis was the church that had grown stagnant, that was resting on its reputation. Philadelphia was the open door of opportunity, that when we find a closed door, it's because God is going to open another door of opportunity for us later. And then Laodicea today is the church that was self-sufficient, and that's not a good thing. So welcome to the church in Laodicea. Remember, this letter is, this revelation was given to John and Patmos in 95 AD. It's going in a circular pattern through Asia Minor, so that's why he started in Ephesus. It's going around in a clockwise pattern, and we end in Laodicea. Laodicea was the wealthiest of all of the cities that we're going to study. And part of the reason why it was so wealthy was because it was on the trade route from Asia to Ephesus. Now remember, Ephesus was a port city. Uh, that, That was the main port city for all of Asia Minor. So anything going into that, that wanted to be exported was going in through Laodicea from Asia to Ephesus or vice versa, imported into Ephesus going into Asia. So everything flowed right there into Laodicea, in and to. And so it became a very, very wealthy place. It was in the Lycus Valley and still is today. I'm showing you pictures of the ruins today. Uh, it was in the Lycus Valley. It kind of sat on, on a plateau, kind of on a tabletop. And this is a, an uh, aerial view, obviously, of the ruins today. It's a, it's a huge, huge archaeological site. A ton of stuff there. But even though it had a lot of trade and commerce going for it, they had a major problem. If you think about the three things that people need to live, they need food, shelter, and water. And guess what they didn't have? Water. They didn't have water, but they did have some great water sources uh, right around them. Six miles to the north, there was a city called Hierapolis. A Hierapolis had hot springs. You can see it. This, this is from standing in Laodicea. Uh, looking at, and it looks white. It looks like there's snow. And that's actually the hot springs that are there in Hierapolis. And, and you can go in. It, again, I mean, you look like, it looks like the Alps. But those are all the, the mineral deposits. It's like travertine uh, cliffs. It, actually, the place is called Pamukkale today, which means cotton cliffs or cotton castle because of the way that it looks, because it's so white. It's beautiful. But this was hot water. These were hot springs that made this way because of the mineral deposits. We were actually able to walk through there, and it's, it's not like piping hot. Uh, we're certainly spoiled with boiled water, but I mean, it was warm, warm water. Uh, really cool. So they had, they had higher opolis that had really warm water. Then they had uh, 10 miles to the east, they had Colossae. Now, you know Colossae because of 
Colossians. That was the church in Colossians, and Colossians actually mentions uh, Laodicea. And so that is sitting at the bottom of one of those hills or mountains. It depends on where you're from. It, from Texas, we look at those as mountains. Um, so I, I don't know what you call it, but those were spring-fed cold waters that would, that would flow down. And we went to Colossae. There's not much there as far as ancient ruins, but we stopped and, and stuck our hand in the side of a ditch. I hope it was just the spring water that was flowing down, but it was cold. It was very cold. And so you could tell a difference. They had hot water from Hierapolis and they had cold water from Colossae, but these were miles away, miles and miles away. But these were people of means and so they tried to figure out a way that they could pay to get that water into them. So they created this piping system. They literally piped in hot and cold water uh, into their city. It was an elaborate piping system made of stone, and these are, are clay pipes. And you can see the calcium deposits inside of those pipes that look a lot like Hierapolis. Remember all those mineral deposits that were white, pamukkale, the cotton cliffs? That's what's coming into these pipes. And so they were trying to pipe water into this tabletop city that sat on this major, major trade route. I mean, this was their main concern, was getting water into their city. And I think that's why Jesus starts the way that he starts in verses 15 and 16. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you would either be cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You see, Jesus sees how preoccupation with comfort can lead to a lack of purpose. Jesus sees how preoccupation with comfort can lead to a lack of purpose. So I set up for you the different kinds of water that they had and, or were trying to get. And they were trying to bring it in to make their lives certainly more comfortable in the city of Laodicea. And he says, I wish that you were either hot or cold. Now, I've heard sermons about this before on this subject. And the way that preachers have interpreted this uh, in one way that they've interpreted this, I believe is wrong, and it's this. They say, Jesus would either you be red, hot, you know, white, hot, passionate for him, or he'd rather you be just totally against him. And, and so don't ride the fence. Be for him or be against him. And I think that's an incorrect interpretation of this verse. I don't think Jesus wants anybody to be against him. I mean, think about it. Does that make any sense? No. I mean, 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us that he wishes none would perish but that all would come to a saving knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. And so it's not that he wants you to be either for him or against him. I think what he's describing here is the water, or the water sources that were trying to be brought into the city. You see, both of those sources, the hot water had a purpose and the cold water had a purpose. The hot water, in fact, in, in the city of Hierapolis, the Romans made baths. You could have a hot water bath. We all get that. We all understand that. If you were in Colossae and you could actually get cold water into your city, you'd have a cool, refreshing drink. You would want it either hot or cold. You wouldn't want it in between. You wouldn't want it lukewarm. In fact, back in those days, uh, if someone was sick, they would use lukewarm water to induce vomiting, to, to help you uh, feel better. And I think that's why Jesus says, if because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. That he doesn't, he doesn't want you to be lukewarm. He wants you to have a purpose, hot or cold. Be purposeful. But when we are preoccupied with our own comfort, like the Laodiceans, we lose our purpose because our purpose is not to make heaven on earth here for ourselves. Our purpose is to live for the home that we're going to and to take people with us, not build our kingdom here, to live for the Lord's kingdom now and to march toward that kingdom forever and to ask people to join in. That's our purpose. But the Laodiceans, they were preoccupied with bringing in and making their lives more comfortable into their city. And he says, you're lukewarm, you've lost your purpose. That's not the purpose of the church. 
The purpose of the church isn't to be the holy huddle. The purpose of the church is to be purposeful for Jesus, not for your own sake, not to pursue the things that you want to pursue. And I think this is very easy for us specifically as Americans to fall into. Um, It's very easy for us to get more, to want more comfort. Uh, you know, I was thinking about the, the Lord's Prayer this week, and uh, I told you guys, we, we say that with uh, our oldest, when we go to school every day, and I was thinking about, just as an American, you know, we have so many choices these days, you know, you, choices of everything, and so many choices that fit our comfort or, or our style that make us more comfortable, and I was thinking about the line, you know, uh, Lord, give us today our daily bread, and I was thinking, you know, as an American, I'm like, uh, Lord, uh, give me gluten-free bread today, you know, or, or Lord, do you have any carb-free options? You know, can I have those today? You know, we, we, we want more comfort ourselves. In fact, I, I, I rewrote the Lord's Prayer for the Laodiceans, Cody's word, so if it's heretical, it's my fault, Okay. But I rewrote the Lord's Prayer from a Laodicean's perspective. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Don't let your kingdom come because my will's not done on earth as I try to build my heaven. I don't need your daily bread as I can get everything myself. And I don't need forgiveness for my trespasses against you as I don't meet with you. So lead me nowhere as I have my own places to go, but certainly deliver me from evil. For mine is my kingdom and my pleasure and my comfort forever on earth, amen. And too often that, we don't don't say that with our lips, but so often that is really the sentiment of our prayers. Of we wanna build our heaven right here, so Lord, don't come. Don't ask me to do anything that I don't wanna do. And we become preoccupied with our own lives and our own entertainment, that we lose our purpose for Jesus. And he's calling the church back in Laodicea, and he's calling us back to our purpose for him. And that's what he confronts. Jesus confronts self-sufficiency that detracts from dependency on God. You see, ultimately, that was the Laodiceans' goal or their end, was that they would be self-sufficient. I don't wanna go to Hierapolis to get hot water. I don't wanna have to go to Colossae to get cold water. I want it here and I want it now because I wanna be self-sufficient. I don't wanna be dependent on any other city. I don't wanna be dependent upon anyone else. And that sounds so like us that we don't wanna be dependent on anyone. We want to be self-sufficient and the Lord will never move you to a place where you're independent of him, ever. That's not his purpose for you. His purpose is for you to depend on him as the heavenly father because you can't live without his power. But that's exactly what he's confronting at the church in Laodicea was their own self-sufficiency. The name Laodicea for, for the city means the people rule. So forget in God we trust, the people rule. It, it's me. It's my rule, it's my way, and I don't have to trust in anyone but myself. I mean, folks, we are Laodicea. I mean, let's just be clear here. These are modern day real struggles that we face, I face on a daily basis of wanting to be self-sufficient and independent from God, and that's what he confronts. In fact, so they were so independent that I told you last week, remember in Philadelphia of the earthquakes, the earthquakes that, that tore down and devastated uh, Philadelphia in AD 17, and I told you there were tremors that continued to happen after that in that region. Well, actually, one of those was in 60 AD. Remember, this is being written in 95. 60 AD, an earthquake comes through, devastates Laodicea. So the Roman government steps in and says, we're gonna provide government aid to rebuild all the cities in that region. And they give it to every city in that region, all the cities that we've studied, get that aid except for Laodicea. Laodicea says, Rome, we don't need your money. We don't want your stinking money. 
In fact, the, the Roman historian Tacitus says, Laodicea arose from the ruins by the strength of her own resources with no help from us. I mean, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and do it yourself. That was Laodicea. I mean, does this not sound like a proud modern day American? America, you know? This is it. And this is the person that Jesus is calling back to, that he's calling out to to come and depend on him. Jesus confronts that. And he confronts the different things that they were depending on. If you look at verse 17, he says, for you say, I am rich and I have prospered and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I put a chart on your sermon notes so that you can see what they had and it's gonna contrast with what they needed and Jesus is gonna contrast that. But if you'll look at the section that says what they had, they had material wealth on earth. In fact, Laodicea was known for being one of the first banking systems in the world, in the ancient world. Had a great bank because of all the commerce coming in and out. They had black wool garments that repelled water. I, they don't know, historians don't know if the, the sheep had a certain sort of blackish tint to their wool uh, because of the mineral deposits that we studied that we just looked at in Laodicea and Colossae, but they, they had this black wool that was water repellent that all the world wanted. So they had fine garments, fine clothing, material goods. They also had uh, Phrygian powder used for ISAV. They had a medical school there where people would come and even Roman emperors came there to get their eyes healed it was a salve that they would put on. This is what they have. But Jesus says, and if you look at verse 18, he says, he contrasts it. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. See, so you are wealthy, but what Jesus says that you need is wealth that will last into eternity. Wealth that lasts through the, that fire that we talked about in 1 Corinthians 13, that we talked about in 2 Corinthians 5, that James talks about in James chapter 1, verse 12, uh, the crown that comes from suffering. These, these folks didn't want to suffer. We'll do anything to not suffer. And I get it. I mean, let's not be idiots and run into suffering. But man, some, sometimes that's the only way we're going to grow. And then white garments that covered their sin, not black wool, wool garments that repelled water, but white gover- uh, garments that covered their sin. And nakedness has always been a metaphor for shame. If you look back at the garden, as soon as they sin, what do they do? They go and they cover themselves up their shame. And he says, you need white garments that cover over your sin and shame, like white being obviously purity. And you need spiritual salve to see the shortcomings of your self-sufficiency. They were blind and unaware to their dependency upon the Lord their own spiritual condition. So he contrasts what they have and what they needed. And when I look at what they have, let, let, I'm, I'm gonna categorize these things, but they had health, wealth, and prosperity. That's what they had. They, they had everything. And in our modern day lives, our modern day American lives, that's what we rest on, is health, wealth, and prosperity. But we say we're fine. We've got everything, We've, we have means, we have everything we want, we have a great savings account and everybody's healthy and we go, praise God, I, I, I don't need him. Kind of ironic, but you know, we, don't, we don't need God. I, I, I almost see it as a stool, as a three-legged stool of health, wealth, and prosperity that we rest on. And sometimes, folks, the, the most loving thing that God can do is remove one of the legs on that stool so that you begin to lean into him and he removes health or wealth or prosperity. And he begins to take those things out of your life because you were never meant to, first of all, those are false senses of security. Those aren't really secure means in in any way. All of those things can be taken away from you like that. And he wants you to lean into him so he removes one of the legs on that stool and you begin to fall into him. And that's not because he doesn't love you, it's because he does love you. If you look back at at verse 19, it's the most loving thing that he can do. He said, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. 
And he says, so be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. The word zealous is actually, uh, um, it's the same word used in the Greek for jealous. And it actually means get hot. Get hot, which is a, a great a nuance here as he's talking about the hot and cold. I'd rather spit you out of my mouth if you're lukewarm. He says, get hot because those whom I love, I discipline or I reprove, or I correct, or I admonish. And maybe you're finding yourself in a place where one of the legs on that stool of health, wealth, and prosperity is being removed. He's asking you to lean into him because you were never supposed to be independent of him in the first place. That's why he's doing that, is because he loves you. He is the one who is secure. He is the one who is sure. You see, what Jesus is commanding the church in Laodicea and us today is, to, is not to be Christless Christians. We can't be Christless Christians. Or another way to put it in modern day language, cultural Christians. Of just, hey, you go to church, but you have no dependency upon God. You have no relationship with God. It looks like everything is okay, and because you're going to church, maybe you even assume that God's blessing you in that way. And maybe he is blessing you, but he's not blessing you so that you will take his means and run away from him. That was the prodigal son, remember? Let me take your blessings and run away from you. And that's not why he blesses you. He never blesses you to run away from him. And so many of us live these Christless Christian lives where we don't embrace Jesus for ourselves and we don't depend on him on a daily basis, we have just a form of godliness. In fact, that's what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter three. You can write it down. I just wanna read it to you. 2 Timothy chapter three, verses one to five. Paul is describing to Timothy what happens in the last days. And he says, but understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. Just listen to this. Does this not sound like today? Today. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. And here's the kicker. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Paul tells Timothy, avoid such people. I don't wanna be, and I certainly don't want any of us to be having the form of godliness and denying his transformative power. And that's what he's confronting here. The power of God doesn't come through health, wealth, and prosperity. The power of God comes through his transformative Holy Spirit, which is at work in us. And the Holy Spirit is always drawing us to more dependence and to a deeper walk with the Lord. And that's what we're called to do because he's trying to come in and be a part of our lives. If you look back at verse 20, He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Interesting thing that went on in history with uh, that I think Jesus is calling on here back in the Roman world. uh, Roman soldiers were able to, uh, they had the right as, as Roman soldiers to go into any house if they were on a march or if they were in battle and they were able to refresh themselves however they liked. They were able to use your bed, they were able to raid your fridge and do whatever they needed as soldiers to get the job done. So they could just literally barge into your house. And Laodicea was known as a uh, favorite stopping point for Roman soldiers because they were so wealthy. These were wonderful places that had great food, great accommodations, so Roman soldiers would just barge in and make themselves at home. And I think Jesus is using that historical uh, reference here to say, I'm not barging into your house. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm not gonna barge in, I'm gonna knock. Are you gonna let me in? You're gonna let me into your life. 
because he's not coming in your life to take. He's coming into your life to give. And so the choice remains for us today to invite Christ into your life. Invite Christ into your life. I think it probably needs to be said here that there are some of you that have sat through this series and you've heard all of these messages and you may have a form of godliness and you've denied its power. Let me tell you right now, Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart and he's waiting for you to let him in. And you can kick against the goads and you can be independent yourself and say you don't need him because you have health, wealth, and prosperity and my friend, those things are gonna fail you. What I would want you to hear is this, that you need to accept Christ as the solution to your problem this world can never fix. You have a problem that this world can never fix, that hot water, cold water, banking systems, great material wealth will never solve, and it's a sin problem. And the only solution to your sin problem is Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins and rose from the dead. You need to place your trust in him today for the forgiveness of your sins and the eternal life everlasting that he offers to you. It's a free gift. All you have to do is open up the door and accept it. That's it. That's what I would want you to do today. It'll change your life now. It'll be the greatest encouragement to me forever. And I guarantee you, greatest encouragement for the people sitting around you as well. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Would you invite Christ into your life? He's offering you that free gift today. Not to come into your life to take from you like those Roman soldiers, but to come into your life and give you life as we've talked about in John chapter seven when Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink. And then a spring of living water will well up from within him. So you don't have to draw on external sources. When you allow Christ into your life, you become a source of life yourself because you have Christ in your life. That's what he offers you uh, today. Would you invite him into your life? And maybe you've already made that decision. Then what I'd ask for you to do is surrender to his purpose for your life rather than the one suggested by this world. Surrender to his purpose for your life rather than the one suggested by his world. I just think about the preoccupation that these Laodiceans had with building their kingdom on earth instead of pursuing his kingdom in heaven. That's what he's called to do. And I love what Jesus says in Mark chapter eight. He says, for what does it profit a man or a woman to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? It all stays here, my friend. (laughs) Doesn't do you any good. If you're living for this world, what you don't realize is you're playing a game you're gonna end up forfeiting. You're automatically gonna lose. And he's saying you can gain your soul for eternity and eternal life if you surrender to his purpose. Don't play the game thinking it all stays here because it doesn't. And then finally, Risk for God in such a way that you must depend on him. Risk for God in such a way that you must depend on him. You know, one of the reasons I I think we very easily deceive ourselves, that, that talent curse. Talent can be a curse when it deceives us into thinking that we don't need God. And one of the ways that we deceive ourselves into thinking that we're self sufficient is we don't do anything we're not good at, we don't do anything where we need help. We don't do anything where we depend on God. And my friend, if you're living that kind of life, you're not living a life that pleases God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse six says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. If you're not living a life of faith in God, where God, I'm depending on you, I've gotta have faith in this situation, then you're not living a life that's pleasing to him. Your life of self-sufficiency where it's like, God, I don't need you. Aren't you happy with me that I haven't asked you for anything? Aren't you happy with me that I've left you alone? You may feel that way with your kids, but that's not the way God is. 
He wants you to come to him. He wants you to live by faith. And if you're not living by faith, you're not living a life that's pleasing to him. I read a letter. This, this is in Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. He was talking about, he was trying to inspire those folks that were obviously um, his aid and, and helping him in the civil rights movement. And he wrote from the Birmingham jail, I just love this, this quote. He was trying to inspire uh, those folks with him by the early church. And he said, whenever the early Christians entered a town, the power structure got disturbed and immediately sought to convict them for being disturbers of the peace. I'm like, man, what if we are disturbers of the peace? Obviously in a good way. And outside agitators, but they went on with the conviction that they were a colony of heaven and had to obey God rather than man. They were small in number, but big in commitment. And this is the kicker line. They were too God intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. Too God intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. That's the risk, man. That's a life lived by faith where we're small in number, but big in commitment because we have a big God. That's the life he's calling us to live. Not a life of self-sufficiency, but dependency on him. And Jesus rewards those who invite him into their life. Obviously for the first time, but then every time to be with him forever. And he says, to the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on the throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. The picture, remember, we conquer as we hold on to the conquering victorious king. But the picture here is of the games going on in a big arena and the ruler is sitting in a vaulted position. And the, the, whoever won the game, the victor, was uh, given the right or invitation to come up into the, the ruler's box or suite and to sit and enjoy everything that they had from his vantage point. And that's the picture going on here that Jesus was victorious on earth. And he was allowed to come and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and we as we hold on to the conquering king because he is the resurrected Jesus, the resurrected savior. We're allowed to follow that same path and sit with him in the victor's booth, in the victor's suite. That, that's, that's what he offers to us when we invite him into our life, a life of dependency. We can't do it by ourselves, but where we hold on to the conquering king. So I'd like to end this series the same way we began in the same verse that we began in Revelation chapter one. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him John to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keeps what is written in it for the time is near. God, we thank you for your encouragement through your word. I thank you that what you call us from, you enable us to and you're calling us from a life of self-sufficiency to depend on you and you are certainly able, you're certainly willing to come into our lives and to change us, even into those areas that we've locked away that are dark, that are messy, you say you'll come in and that'll be the transformative power. Lord God, let us not have a form of godliness and deny its power, but let your power be made perfect and shown in our lives for your sake and your glory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.